All right, so we're beginning with the food inspections.xlsm sheet. Go ahead and download that and open it. I posted that hastily before class, and I left the word end sub in the module there. So just delete it. It'll open with an error. It says end sub. There's an error. Oh, no, just delete the end sub or put sub in front of it because we're going to be working on this today. So the data that we're looking at when we see here is data from last Tuesday. So I just downloaded from the city. The city of Chicago makes almost all of their data public. And so th these really are uh, inspections of restaurants and other food establishments that were made within the past seven days. These are the, all the ones that were made on February 7th. Uh, how many, there's, there's a few of them. What is there? Seven, so 70, on that day, there were 77 inspections made by a handful of inspectors. I don't know how many there are. There's probably at least 15, maybe 20 inspectors that are making these inspections. Up. So they're going around and they're, you know, if we look at this, here's the first one. There's the address. Let's see, we'll go all the way over here. So here's the name. It's the Piccolo Mondo Cafe, also known as Piccolo Mondo Cafe. That's interesting. These are always the same. Oh, they're not quite the same. Here's one. Reggae Island Jerk Chicken Incorporated, also known as Reggae Island Jerk Chicken. <laughs> Oh, here's one. Oh, I've seen that before. That's like a chain, isn't it? I've never been. There. Anyway, that's the that's the place. Let's just pick one. Here's the here's no the noodles party. All right, noodles party. They are a high risk establishment. Hey, what does that mean? High risk. You could be high risk, medium risk, or low risk. What does it mean? Yeah, you've got you've got rodents all over them. The high risk. They're all high risk. Good heavens. No, it's not what it means at all. What it means is you are working with foods that if they go bad, they could kill somebody. So a bakery is not a high risk. You know, if a loaf of bread goes bad or a donut goes bad, one bite and you're not going to eat it and it won't kill you. You know, it's moldy and you go, yuck, spit it out, you're okay. Uh, so that's a probably, bakery is probably medium risk. Uh, but uh, these guys are restaurants, are all high risk. So that's what it means. Now, is there any low risk here? There's a sushi place that's low risk. That's what you call corruption. Someone paid that guy off. Low risk. We're serving raw fish. That's not going to go bad. Oh, here's a low. Here's a grocery store. It's low risk. Out inspecting the. It's a Dollar Tree, no less. Okay. Yeah, it's like chips, chips and you know drinks. But it's low risk, right? Because they're not—they're probably not even handling the food. It's all comes pre-packaged. They put up on the shelf, and that's why it's low risk. That's the address. Da, 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 da. They had a so this is a re-inspection after a complaint. So here's a down here is a complaint inspection. Someone filed a complaint. The guy goes out and looks at it. That person. So if we think of this one, sometime earlier there was a complaint. They went out and looked at it and said, "Oh yeah, there's a problem here. You guys got to fix it up." And now they've passed their re-inspection. And then here are the coordinates. You know, if you wanted to send a drone attack in, I guess you could do that with these coordinates. So, um, ah, so the violations, let's look at this one. Let's go ahead and look at this Dollar Tree violation and see what it was, what was going on here. So this is, that's the inspection number there in the first column. If you come to the violations page and look for that number, then here's the kind of the four different things they had. Well, they passed. This will be probably this will probably be pretty boring, but here it is: outside garbage, waste, grease, and storage area needs to be clean, rodent-proof, and all containers covered. So that was their violation on their previous inspection. The comment says it's been corrected and whatever. Here. Comments must clean shelves. Looks like this one they didn't actually fix. Food and non-food contact equipment utensils clean and free of abrasive detergents. Comments must clean shelves where the potato chips are. Observed holes in the floor. Uh, fix the holes in the floor. Anyway, so that's what these are. So you've got specific things. You know, I wonder how prevalent the word rodent is in this. Oh, wait a minute. Still, it found one over here. And rodents. Instructed to remove items from against the wall. Oh, to be able to monitor for rodents. They didn't say they found them. 
Apparently they had stuff stacked all the way against the wall and that's a no-no. Why? You can't look behind it to see who's living back there. And so, so yes, yeah, so the word rodent, yeah, you're right. The only search in there, so let's look again. Rodent. Apparently there's a few discussions of rodent. Okay. Oh yeah, we could say find all, couldn't we? 21 cells have the word rodent. Ugh. All right, so here's the idea. Here's what I'd like to do with this data set. Window. So let's why don't we start over here. And our whole purpose today is to deal with what's referred to as conditional branching. Executing code conditionally based on what we're looking at. So here's what I'd like to do. It used to be back, it used to be one of the great examples we would do in VBA when I was trying to show people the power of VBA. We would do stuff like conditional formatting. And then Excel got conditional formatting built into it. Um, so it was kind of boring. Uh, why wouldn't you do that with conditional formatting? Well, you could, I guess. But VBA is so much nicer. But that's what we're going to do today, just as a way to be able to have an example to see how different kinds of complex conditions work with conditional branching. We're going to do some formatting based on, we're going to put colors on the backgrounds of cells based on what information we have here. So let's start with a pretty simple one. So we'll make a sub, I'm going to call it, hmm, we'll call it paint cells. And I'm going to set up a pretty straightforward uh, loop, one we've worked with before. Dim, dim row as, hmm. What data type should I use for row? It's going to be a, a, a variable that allows me to count through all my rows. I could use integer. What's the limit for integer? I could go up to 32,000 something. And that's going to be clearly more than I need here because I don't even think I have 176 or so of these inspections. So I've got to go to row 77. So integer, actually, I don't like integer. I like either the one smaller than it, byte, because it's big enough to do the data I have here, or I like the one bigger than it, which is long. Why would I like long more? It turns out that for me, anytime I'm, I'm declaring something I know is going to iterate across rows, I prefer to use long because there are more than 32,000 rows. You know, I might need, not for this example, but I just think for me, it's just like if it's a row, it should be long. I'm using it to keep track of a row, but Integer would be fine. Byte would be better if you're trying to save those extra two or three bytes of RAM. You could do that. It doesn't really matter. Let me also do this. Let me dim S as a worksheet. Then let's set S equal to worksheets. Out of all the worksheets, the collection of worksheets, which one do I want? The one called food inspections. It's food underscore inspections. Case doesn't matter. I'll have a do loop. Inside this loop, I'm going to put do events. Have we talked about do events? Do events is going to make sure we can get out of this thing. If we accidentally put ourselves into an, end, an endless loop, hitting escape or control break should break into that loop as long as do events is in there. Then I'll give myself a way to get out of the loop. X equals X plus one. Whoops, not X, it's row. Row equals row plus one. And we're going to do until hmm, s dot cells row number row column number ones value is blank. Right. So that's a loop that is fairly straightforward. I'm expecting. In fact, if we put like a debug dot print statement here, we should be able to see it print all of those values x and then the value in column a run this. Actually, anytime I'm going to run something, I like to save it first. If it has a loop, I'd like to save it first. So, do events notwithstanding. Okay, I'm trying to save this. I was probably editing a cell. All right, I'll save this in my uh, downloads. Food inspections underscore winter 17. And I'll run that. And it should just print off those values there. 
debug.print row. Do until s.row.value s worksheets cells row. No oh, I need to start row off at something. Row equals two to begin. There we go. Okay, so I would not expect you at this point to be able to roll this loop off of your fingers from memory. But I would expect you to look at it and say, I totally understand everything that's happening here. And with a little work, you could have come up with this by yourself. How many of you are in that situation? You're saying, I understand it, and I think with a little time I could have done it myself. How many of you are saying, is it too late to drop the class? <laughs> okay. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to use an if statement to say, hey, if anything here is high risk, I just want to, I want to color column F if it's high risk. I want to flag those. We could do this with conditional formatting, but I wouldn't have the chance to, 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 to show you what we're going to do with conditional branching today. And it, the color in this cells is nice because it lets you see at a glance what the loop has done. So instead of doing this print in here, we'll do an if statement. So here's the structure for the if statement. If, then, that's the simplest syntax for an if statement. We have if, then we put some condition here, C-O-N-D period, and then over here we have some statement. So my condition is going to be if column F, looking at my current row, if its value is equal to hmm, risk high, then I want to do something. What do I want to do? I want to change the color of that cell's interior. And I'll make that color equal to red. 255 means red. Actually, when you think about colors, there's like 16 million colors. Active cell dot interior dot color equals 255. That's going to make that cell red. You don't have to memorize all 16 million. That's good news. It turns out that there is a function called RGB. You supply it the amount of red you want, no red. The amount of green you want, 255, that's the most you can have. And the amount of blue you want, zero. And that will tell you the number that corresponds to that number, which is no red, all green, and no blue. Or you could actually use the function itself to put the value there, right? So I could do this. I could put that RGB function there, and I could send it all red and nothing else. Uh, and then that would do it. So what this says is we're going we're gonna to loop across all this data using row, row as the control for what we're looking at. And we're going to say if it's a high risk, then we want to change the interior color of that cell to red. Just so we can be sure this is doing just what we want it to do, let me start off here and say s.cells.interior.colorindex equals xl none. Color index, you've got like 51 colors to choose from. Color number seven is yellow, color number five is red, color number three Four is, I don't know, they're, they're all in there. 21 is a light blue. It used to be those are the only colors you could put on the background of Excel. Then they said, you know what? You got them all, 16 million to work with. But the color index is still kind of hanging around. Color index is important though because using the color property, as I'm doing here to set the color, I can make it any color. 16 million to choose from, I can choose any one. But I can't make it no color. I can't take away all the color altogether. To do that, I need the color index property. 
and I use the predefined constant XL none, which is like negative 4,012 or something. Let me print uh, XL none, negative 4,142. That, by, by setting the color index to negative 4,142, that's how we say just take all the color off. Now, I haven't told it which cells I'm talking about on the food inspection sheet. So which cells is it going to assume? All of them. And so this statement here just says, you know what, take all the color off so that when we run this code, we can see exactly what, what, this, color, what this code has highlighted. So I'll run this, and it should put in red every one that is high risk. Wow, looks like most of the inspections are on high risk places. Except this one. There's no risk here, apparently. That's really weird. Hmm. Okay, this is a little bit strange. Most of the times when I've shown you the if statement, I've done it like this. If some condition that evaluates it true or false, then, and then the statement goes down here, and then we say the keyword and if. The difference between these two, well, these two now actually execute exactly the same. But if I want to have more than one statement execute, then it's got to be in this format. So between the if and the end if, all the statements come down onto the next line, and then I'll have as many statements as I want until the end if. But if I only want to have one statement executing, it's possible to put that one statement right up here. Why would you ever do that? It actually ends up being more readable if you have many statements that kind of go next to each other. So if you end up, if some condition is true, then do this. If some condition is true, then do this. If some condition is true, then do this. Then this block ends up being readable then if it's replicated in multiple separate blocks. But the true reason is, is that back in the early days of BASIC, this was the only if statement we had. You couldn't, there was no end if. They hadn't invented end if yet. And so you could only execute one line conditionally based on the if. That's how you did it. What if you wanted two lines? You put two if statements with the same condition in it. It was a terrible, terrible time. Well, it was the 1970s. Everything was bad about the 70s. Actually, the other thing you could do is you could have that one if statement call a sub-procedure. That sub-procedure could have all kinds of statements in it, and when it was done, it would come right back and move on. And that was the main way we did it back then. But now you can put multiple statements just by putting multiple statements inside here. Questions? OK, let's look at a complex condition. So let's say, you know what, I don't really, just because it's high risk, I don't want to paint it. Let's say I want to paint it if it's high risk and they failed their inspection. So I'm just going to, I'm going to hide everything between F and M. So we can see these two together. So now I only want to, I only want to color it if it's high risk and it says fail out here. So, two approaches. I can either come and put a nested if statement in here. So when I get here, I only want to do this if, and then put the condition, put the next condition here. Let's go ahead and do that. So if the next column, if a column, what is it, column M? If column M, equals fail, then we'll make it red. That would do the trick. So now if I run this, I should only see the ones highlighted if it's high risk and they failed the inspection. So here, high risk, fail, that's red. Here, high risk, fail, that's red. Oh, here's a fail, but it's only medium risk. Uh, here's a high risk, but they passed the inspection. So now it's only when both of those conditions are met. Questions here? So this is, a, this is a nested if statement. This is an if statement inside an if statement. Folks, the computer can handle nesting to as many levels as you want to put. 
Your brain can handle nesting to exactly two levels. <laughs> as soon as you say, I'm going to nest to a third level, you have to be extraordinarily careful about what you're doing because that <clears throat> is the number one place that bugs happen in code. code when, 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 when a bug makes its way into production, the most common occurrence of that is somewhere in an, in an if statement nested more than two levels. It's just really, you can think through it. You can draw it out of the picture. That will help. But it's really tough. So anytime you're saying, I'm going to nest three levels to do this, or if you go, you know what, I can do this with a 12-level nested if statement, you're going to see a little angel on your shoulder is going to say, oh, that's a really good idea. And another one's going to say, Dr. Allen said you shouldn't do more than two levels. And at that moment, you have to decide which angel to listen to. OK. Oh, it'll be easy. You can do it. It won't hurt. No one will ever know. Incidentally, you'll definitely want to make sure that when you create an if statement, your syntax for your if and your end if, that nothing comes between them. You can handle two levels of nesting if things are tabbed in properly. If it looks like this, It's already too tough for me. I can't do. I can't deal with this. Can the interpreter deal with this? No problem. This if goes with this end if. This if goes with this one. But you want to make sure that when you go if, you see nothing until you see the end if that goes with it. Okay. Now, let's do this. So I think we ran that and that worked okay. There's some other options we're going to try here in just a second, but now let's bring the else clause in. So these two blocks of code that I have between the then and the else, and then between the else and the end if, they are mutually exclusive. There is no, I'm pretty sure there's no way, there's no good way to be able to make both of these blocks execute on the same path through the code. There might be something evil you could do that would do it. But they're mutually exclusive. And, and what I mean by that is as soon as I hit this if statement right here, if this is false, I jump to the else and I execute what's ever there. There's no way for me to get to the else if this is true. Because if this is true, we come into this block, we execute until we get to the else. Once we get to the else, we jump to the end if automatically. They're mutually exclusive. You can't make them both execute. OK, so let's do this. Let's say if this is not the case, um, then what we're going to do is we're going to paint something else. So this is red. Then we're going to paint the cell in, in green. Make that zero. Make this one 255. All right, so what should I expect to see here? And here's the question. Am I going to have any cells left over in column F where I have my data, where my loop's going across, that are not either red or green? Could I have some that are neither red nor green? The number for green is right there, RGB 0, 255200. If you really want to know the number, we can print it for you. 65280. Yeah, so the question is, can we just put 65280 here and have it be the same thing? The answer is yes. Yeah, that's all this function returns. It just returns a number. It takes some amount of red, some amount of some amount of blue RGB. Some amount of green and some amount of blue, and then it gives you the color index that matches to that particular color. So either way is the same thing. Incidentally, there's also one called XL green. I lied about that. Maybe it's VBA green, VB green. It's a slightly different green. That's another way to get to green. Oh, no, it's not. It's exactly the same green. So that's just a named constant, right? It just made a constant that, 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 that equals 65280. So you're looking at it in your code. That would be, you know, this is a pretty good way to say green. If that's really the one you want, VB Green is probably a better way to do it. But what do you think? 
Am I going to have only red and green, or will I have red, white, and green? Let's run it and find out. Maybe some of you have already run it. Okay, so why do I have red, white, and green? I mean, look, if this one doesn't get executed, isn't this one, if it, I mean, if I don't go here, am I not determined to do this? And the answer is yes. But if I come into it, if I come into this, I still have another threshold to cross. I got to get across this one. So let's suppose this one's true. I drop into this one. This one is false. What happens? I jump to this end if, so I skip that line. Then I get to this else, and since this one was true, then it moves to the end and moves on. See that okay? So what if, what change would I have to make to this code to say, listen, each one of these columns got to be red or green. But I still want only the red ones to show up this way, and then every other one to be green. Take a minute and see if you can figure that out. And by a minute, I mean one minute. So take me a minute to get the timer up. Start. I don't know how to change the time. Ah, stopwatch. Start. There we go. That'll do it. You have a minute. See if you can think about, you don't have to code it, you can if you want, but think about what change you'd have to make so that the red stay red, but everything else goes green. See a couple on the front row looking pretty smug. Did you do it? Yeah. I'll be asking you about it in just a minute. Looks like 40 seconds to spare. Should I pause the video for our remote audience? They got to wait. They can fast forward. I forgot to put the microphone on. I'm working on the built-in mic. Okay. Thoughts. What'd you come up with? Guys in the front row, what'd you do? So I just want to make sure if it wasn't, if it didn't fail and it was not red, then what? What I'm after is just what I have here, but instead, uh, instead of red, white, and green, I want just red and green. The red should be the same. Everything else should be green. That what you did? So yeah, I put this to the else. Aha! Uh -huh. So you came here and said, else, make it, make this one green. All right. No, that's a solution that works. In fact, let me go ahead and make, I'm going to put these both to BB green just so we can see. So that green and red will stand out a little bit better. It's also BB red, by the way. Or BB red. Okay, that would work. I don't like it. I'll tell you, I mean, it worked, so that's plus. I'll tell you why I don't like it here in a second. There's another comment in the back. Ah, another approach. Make everything green and then just change the ones to red. Uh, I like that one better, but... It doesn't demonstrate what I'm trying to demonstrate. So for that reason, I just like it. Go ahead. Um, you just put an and in the if. Yeah, okay, so that's what I'm looking at. So let's talk about that one. Okay, so let me tell you, let me tell you what I find dissatisfying about this approach. This works okay. But here's the problem, conceptually. And in fact, if it was something this simple, I wouldn't mind so much. But anytime you say, all right, I've got two different pathways to get to a block of code, you hear the block of code, make this cell green. If I've got two different paths to get to that code, I really should have that code written just once. Because if someone decides, you know what, that green is making me sick. I'm looking at it and it's, it looks, it's making me feel green, feeling ill. Can you make it yellow? Then I would like to be able to change. I want to, I want to look through this code and find out, look, we just wrote this. We know it's in two places. But a year from now, you're going to come back and, oh my gosh, I don't, who wrote the, I wrote this? I don't remember writing this. I don't remember the first thing about this. You got to look, and then you'll be looking. Uh, where, uh, oh, here's where I turn it to green. 
They'll turn it to yellow. What's the problem? Once you find the first one, you quit looking. There might be a second one. And so if at all possible, anytime you say, you know what, I've got two blocks, I've got two paths to an activity, I want that activity to be written once. And so this, is, this one's a little bit dangerous. Now, the approach that said make them all green and then make some red doesn't suffer from that defect, but it doesn't demonstrate what I'm trying to demonstrate. So that would be, that would be pre preferable to this approach. This one is preferable to approach that doesn't work, but it's not, it's not as maintainable. So here's a different approach. So we can say, listen, the problem that happens here is that we burn our if statement. We burn our condition here. As soon as this one's true, we're done with this if statement. There's no way we're going to come to this else. But there's a second condition that we have to check to make sure that it's red. And so the approach is this. Let's come in here as and say, listen, that has to be true, and this has to be true. Then we'll do this. So now we only hit red, just like before, we only got to red if both of those conditions were true. We still only get to red if both of these conditions are true. But if this second one is false, we haven't burned our if statement yet. We can still drop into the else. Right? Before, we would spend the if statement, spend this first condition when this one was true, and then only to get to this one partially. Does that make sense? Window, right arrow. So now if I run this, that should bring that. Everything that was red before is still red. Everything else comes to green. OK, questions here? How complex can these if statements or the conditions for the if statement get? They can get extraordinarily complex. And it's kind of the same warning. Computer deals with these. The computer breathes this stuff. This is the stuff the computer loves. Complex conditions also very difficult. You get complex conditions and multiple levels of ifs, forget it. Don't even try it. Well, I guess you could. It might end up being good job security. No one else will be able to understand your code. So if you can find a way to simplify, it's always good to simplify. OK, so let's do this. Let's say that I want to paint this if I want to paint it red. I want a little more red in here. I want it red if it's high risk and fail, or if it's high risk and pass with conditions. Pass with conditions is also a little bit scary. What does it mean? It means you barely passed. I'm going to pass you, but you've still got some work to do. All we're saying is it's not so bad, I don't want to have to come out and look at it again. In fact, as I'm thinking about this, Chicago strikes me as a very corrupt city in general. It's probably just from the movies. Wasn't, uh, who was the guy? Al, Al Capone, wasn't that Chicago? Yeah, you see it? That's all I know about Chicago is what I, what I watched on the old movies with Al Capone. It's probably still just as corrupt in my mind. I think. But it seems like this is a pretty good area for corruption, doesn't it? Some guy comes in, he says, you know, I'm looking at that hole in the floor right there and that could let rodents in. I'm gonna have to fail you. I could look the other way, you know. I mean, if I came back there and I couldn't see that hole because a box is on top of that, I might pass this place. I could do that, you know, for a fee. I don't know. Is, I don't know, does this happen? What do you think? How many of you think that's happened in the past year in Chicago? Oh, I do. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not. But here's the point. I look at this pass with conditions and I'm thinking, yeah, that's like almost there. I want to paint that one red too. Incidentally, where did I get this data? Chicago publishes this. I mean, they just make, they, like, almost all of their data is just like open to the public, like transparency. They're trying to get past this, this corruption thing, I guess, by transparent data. Although the one piece of information I'd really like to know, the one that you could actually look for fraud in, in this data, is which inspector did the inspection. They don't publish that. You don't know who made these inspections. But if you could see that different inspectors had different pass rates than others, yeah, you'd know something fishy's going on. So here's what I'd like to do. 
I would like to say I want this to paint red if it's high risk and fail or if it's high risk and pass with conditions. And otherwise, I want it to be green. So I still like this, otherwise make it green. So what do I have to do up here? So now I'm going to add an or onto this, yama. And immediately I feel like breaking this into multiple lines. So if that, if it's high and I put an underscore here, space underscore, or if it's high and it's either fail or now here's what's so tempting to do when you're brand new at this is to say listen I can read this you know this is a very readable thing from you know, the English language perspective so if it's if the if the, the risk is high and column M, which is whether they passed or not, if that's fail or pass with conditions. That looks totally reasonable. In fact, syntactically, it's okay. But this will not execute. Let's try it, see what happens. Oh, I got a type mismatch, darn it. Somewhere hidden in this line is a type mismatch. What does that mean, type mismatch? When it says type, it's talking about the data types. The data types when you create variables. Dim x as byte, dim employee name as string, as boolean. Those are the data types. It's saying you got a type somewhere here that doesn't fit. You're using a type somewhere where that particular type is not allowed. Do you see which one it is? What's that? Row is long. That's okay. The row is not the row is not a problem. Row is two. That's not where the type problem is. The type problem is here. If I want to say, if I want to use the or, well, let me just print true. Let me just let's do this. One equals one. That's true, right? So I'm going to back that off and just call that true. T R U E. So there, there's print true. I'll print true or false. What is it going to do? Pick one? What is that? Am I telling the, look, I don't care which one you print. Print one of these. Is that what it's doing? Is that what I mean by or? No, I mean take this logical expression. And when you, when you have true or false, that evaluates to something. It's not a guess. What is it? It's either true or false. What is it? I think you guys learned this in, in uh, like pre-algebra or something. It was a long time ago. Because most of you were probably gifted students and took pre-algebra in sixth grade or something. But did you ever make truth tables? True and true equals what? True. True and false equals false. False and true equals false. False and false equals false. Yeah. So for and, the only way it's true is if it if they're both true. For false, the only way it's false is if they're both false. So as long as one of these is true, this is going to return true. But here's the point. Or is a Boolean operand. Operand? It's a Boolean operator. That means both of its operands, what you're, what you're operating on, have to be Boolean. So what is true, true, and potato? P-O-T-A-T-O. -T -T -E. e, potato. I love the E on the end of potato. What is, so true and false is true. What's true and potato? It's a type mismatch. Look, you can't say true or potato. What can you say true, true or what? What are your choices? False or true, that's it. You can only put either false or true there. It's the only type that's allowed. That's the point, is that a Boolean operator, or, and, not, x, or, imp, there's a bunch of them. The main ones we want are or, and, and, not, is Boolean on each side. Do I have Boolean on each side here? No. Does this make sense when you look at this in English? Yeah. This thing's got to equal this or that. But or, in the language, has to be a Boolean operator. How do I fix the problem? I just duplicate what I'm looking at on that side. So now I'm saying whatever row I'm on, column M has to equal fail, or whatever row I'm on, column M has to equal pass with conditions. If this whole thing is true, and this is true, so if that condition is true and this condition is true, then we're going to paint it red, otherwise we won't. That's what we're after, right? 
but we still have a problem. And the problem is, which one of these happens first? Remember that for both and and or, on both sides of it, it has to be either true or false. So here's the question. Does this one happen first, and then that's either true or false, and this is true or false? Or does this part happen first? I take this and this, that's either true or false, and then that goes with this one. Any idea? I can never remember. Uh, ultimately, I want to put parentheses in this to make sure that it's right, regardless of which one is really going to happen first. But let's take a look at this. So let's do true and uh, true or false. True or false and true. Will that tell us? Okay, let's suppose the and happens first. This will be false. Uh, and that would be true. If the and happens first, what will this whole thing return? True. Now, if the or happens first, this thing will return true as well. So that's not going to help. How do we do this? So that will be, okay, so if this happens first, I think it has to be like this. False or false will be false. That's not doing it either. <laughs> Should be one of these that we could tell. We'll flip one way or the other. False, it seems like it's got to be false or, and this thing has to be true. True and true. Is this the one that does it? that happens first, this will be true or false. The whole thing will be false. If this happens first, oh, that will be true. Uh, that will be, if that goes first, what will it be? That will be false. Let's do it. False or false? That's going to be false entry. That one, do, one of these will do it. I can't remember which one it is. True or false? That will be true. This will be true no matter which one goes first. False. <laughs> I want to pause the video so I don't uh, you know, immortalize my uh, my ineptitude here. Anyone can figure this out? There definitely is one of these that will do it. False or true, true and false. Okay, I think it's this. False or true and false. False or false, true. There's not that many to try. If we could just list them all. If this happens first, this will be false. This will be true. Okay, this is the one. Woo! Okay. So if, if the and happens first, what will this be? False. This will be false, and this will give me true or false, which is, which is true. true. If this happens first, I will get true and false, which is false. Okay. Whew. This will tell us which one happens first. Okay. So this is true, which means the and happens first. Is that what you guys said? That was the or? This, so the and must happen before the true. So that means that this, this part would happen first. And is that what I want? It's not. I want, th I want this to happen together. So I want this to happen and then either one of these. So yeah, I've got to bind these together with parentheses. What's that? Well, by it works. Let's take a look at the code and see if, see if this does what I think it's supposed to do. So I think I wanted to say, listen, if it's high risk and either fail or pass with conditions, 
I want to show in red. Hey, that one's a pretty neat trick. The inspector's coming. Put the out of business sign up. <laughs> That's kind of neat. It looks like the guy actually went out there to inspect. Oh, they're out of business. Oh, well. Okay, so, but you're saying it did the same thing without the parentheses? Let's check. There's a comment here. Go ahead. Oh, I, it's possible that what happens is maybe there's just no medium risk that has possible conditions. And so it would have highlighted the same thing because it's only highlighting, it's highlighting things that are either high risk and fail or anything that's possible conditions. And oh, I see what you're saying. high risk possible conditions, then we're still getting the same thing. Oh, no, there's one. So here's a medium pass with conditions. So that would yeah, I don't want that. I don't want this one to highlight. I want only high, and then fail or pass with conditions. So let's put the parentheses back in. Run it again. Yeah. So there is. We've got one line that lets us see the difference. You're exactly right. Got it. Okay. Okay, so do you get what I mean when I say these conditions are pretty tough for us to work through? My rule is, folks, and it's partially the reason I didn't really know which one of these executes first, is that I always put the parentheses. I got a complex condition, put the parentheses in so I can see exactly what's happening first. Even if the order of operation, unless they're all ands or all ors, then it's okay. Otherwise, you've got ands and ors, put in the parentheses. Okay, whew. How did it get to be that late already? We haven't covered nearly enough. We could nest, did we nest this? We nested this earlier, of course. Even with this, we could nest it. We can nest on the else. Here's what we haven't seen. We haven't seen the else if. Let's put the else if in. So it's now possible for us to say, uh, if it's, why don't we do this? Why don't we say, if it's medium, if it's medium risk, I don't even care what the result is. If it's medium risk, I want it to be yellow. Well, we can do that right here. I will say else if, one word. I'll have some other condition here, and then I will say then. This one will be for VB yellow. And the condition is if it's risk medium, I want it to be yellow. Risk to medium. And so now, if I paint it red, I mean, if, I piss, if it, this whole thing's true, it'll be red. Otherwise, we'll check to see, hey, is it just medium? Then it'll be yellow. Otherwise, it'll be green. So now we've got this one yellow, other ones the same way they were. How many else if clause could I have? Yeah, as many as you want. Else if, else if, else if, else if, I have a long block. The point here is that they are all mutually exclusive. Is it possible for two of these to be true? Is it possible for this condition to be true and this condition to be true? Well, it turns out, in this particular example, it's not. But could I formulate a condition that says, yep, this is true and this is true? Yeah. In fact, in fact, let's do this. What if I said, listen, if it's high risk and it's either pass or pass with conditions, that's what I want to be read. Otherwise, if it's just high risk, regardless of what else it might say, high risk pass, I think it's the only other option, then I want that to be yellow. So now green is only, we only get green if it's, <coughs> doesn't meet any of the ones before. Is it possible now that this condition could be true and this condition to be true up here? Yeah. In fact, every time that this condition is true, this one is too, isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that the case? Yeah, because for this one to be true, risk has to be high. And there's something else tacked onto it. But if that one's true, they're both true, well, this is risk has to be high. 
This one has to be true. So why don't they all turn yellow? It's because they're mutually exclusive. As soon as I get to one that's true, I execute that block till I get to the else or the else if or the end if, and then I drop to the end of the structure. I never even check this condition, even though it's true every single time this one is. Are we following that? As soon as we get one that we can execute, we execute its block of code, and then we drop to the end. Every single one of these conditions could be true. And it would only then execute the first one. Got it? OK, let's look at another, a different statement that we use for conditional branching. I'm going to copy this procedure. I'm going to call it paint cells. This one paint cells two, and then paste in its copy. And I'm going to get rid of this whole block. So I've got just the structure of the of the loop. So paint cells, I've copied it, so the other one's still down here somewhere, paint cells two. But no more ifs. The whole if block is gone. That's all I did. I copied it, got rid of the if block. In fact, for this one, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the violations page. Whoops. So here I am on the violations page. And what I'd like to do on this one is I would like to, I would like to highlight different rows here depending on which kinds of violations there were. So these numbers here are like standard violations. Number 18, no evidence of rodent infestation. So if you have a, if you have a number 18 violation, it's something dealing with this rule. There's a rule. There should be no evidence of rodent or insect infestation or something. So if you've got an 18, there's something about rodents. In fact, that'd be a pretty good business. Get the information that was just barely posted by the city of Chicago, find out who got cited for rodents, and then show up there and offer, offer your extermination services. <clears throat> that'd be pretty good. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. So instead of looking at food inspections, the worksheet I'm working on is going to be violations. I'm still going to iterate across all the data, but now I'm going to look a little differently. I'm going to use a statement called the select statement. Select is the way it starts. It ends with the keyword end select. Now, a little more to do up here at the front. The way select works is it says, all right, we are going to start with one expression, and then we're going to look to see which of the different options match that expression. On the if, else if, else if, else if, independent condition, true or false, come down, another independent condition, true or false, another independent condition. In the select case statement, it is, we're looking at one expression and we're comparing everything else to that one expression. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to pull off the number from column B. So here's how I'll pull off the number from column B. My active cell here, just... Here's the trouble. Sometimes they've got a space in the beginning, sometimes they don't, but it looks like there's a period afterwards all the time. So let me trim what I have in my active cell. All right, that gets rid of the space at the beginning. But now I'll take that whole thing and I will split it based on the period. quote, period, quote, and I will return the zeroth element. That gets me the 11. If I'm on the 29, it should bring me the 29. So split function we've talked about. It returns an array. We'll talk about arrays in detail. We can specify which of the strings it cuts it up into by an index beginning with zero and going up from there. So this expression will get me the number that's at the beginning of this data. So here's the syntax, select, case, and then that expression. Now, I don't want the active cell. What I want is s dot cells, row number row, column number two. So s is the worksheet I'm working on. It's my violation sheet. Row is what I'm counting through. I'm looking at column number two. So as I look through this, it'll have a different number each time. Okay, so that's my structure. I've set up the, the, the expression that I'm going to try to evaluate against. So we're looking at this condition, and then we're going to say, all right, you know what? If it's 18, 18 is the rodent one. 
that's pretty dangerous. I want to paint column A to be red. Here's how I say it. Case 18. Then I will say the statement that I want, and that will be make this red. Uh, but not column F, column 1. So now when I run that, it should only paint red the cells that deal with number 18 out here. Now, there are several things I can do. So any questions on this structure so far? The whole point here is that I would say, you know what? If it's 18, make it red. If, I don't know. If it's 33, I don't even know what 33 is. If it's 33, make it yellow. Otherwise, make it green. We got some yellow in there. Should have some red still. So Case just says, look at whatever expression I have here and see which one of these matches. If none of them match, we get here and do case else. Just like a series of if, else if, else if, else if, else if, these blocks are mutually exclusive. As soon as I get a match between whatever I've specified here and whatever I have here, I execute that code. As soon as I hit the case, I'm done. I drop out and we move on. Now, we can do a little more sophisticated things here. I could say, you know what? Maybe 18 or maybe 16 or 18. 16 or 18. I can just say 16 comma 18 here, and now a 16 should go red as well. Are there any 17s out here? No 17s. There's 11, so I do this. I could say, you know what, anything from 11 to 18. 11 space to 18. We'll make that go red. So now my 11s, my 16s, and my 18s should go red. 11, 18, 18, 13, so we can see that range is working. So I can make a range. I could say, case is greater than 30. Make all those yellow. Hmm. So I've got a lot of flexibility that I can do here with the, the case statement. I can put a list. I can say else, comma separated list, which one it matches. Is it greater than? Is it less than? I wonder if I can do an and. What if it's greater than 30 and less than 40? I don't know if I can do this. Apparently I can't do that. I wonder if I can put a comma there. Yeah. Uh, I liked it syntactically, but did it do it? No, it didn't. Uh, I definitely can't. I wonder if I can do between. Yeah, I don't know. Apparently, I can't do that. If it's going to be, a, if it's, I can, I can have a range. Oh, that's how I would do it. I would do. That's how I would do it. I would do eleven to eighteen. I'd do thirty to forty. That would work. But if I'm doing an open-ended range, it's got to be just one condition. Questions on the case statement? Select case statement. Which one do you think is more readable? Yeah, the case statement is way more readable. And you should use it when, we, when we're doing here, when we're saying, listen, it's one condition, and depending on, or, or one expression, depending on its value, I'm going to do something different based on its different values. That's what you should use it for. You can do anything. The case statement, you can do anything with the else if, the if else if statement, that you can do with the case statement. It's just more wordy. It's not nearly as easy to read. Okay, last thing for today. Uh, let's suppose that 
here in my else, instead of making things green, do I have anything to be green? I don't even have any green. Else is greater than 40. <coughs> Syntax error. Else is greater than 40. That's something that will turn green. If we're going to say, instead of making these green, case else, I wanted to, this would be a weird thing to do, but let me go ahead and do it. Um, no, we'll just, we'll just talk about it. Let's suppose that in here we had some other loop. Do loop. Do until x is greater than 100. x equals x plus 1. I'm not sure what I'm doing with this, with this 100. If y equals 66, then exit do. Okay. I don't know, I don't know what I have in mind here. I'm only the next two because I haven't declared x or y here, but let's take a look at it. Let's so I've I've got I get down here and say, okay, some other process I'm gonna have to loop across and look at some stuff. But now let's suppose if this condition is true, whatever it is, what I want to do is I want to get out of not just this do loop that's here. But I want to get out of this do loop that ends here. I can get out of this do loop with exit do. That lets me out of this do. But where does that put me? That puts me right here. It's a fairly common thing to be working through this kind of nested loops. You get down here and you realize, oh, I've reached the end of what I needed to find. I've now found what I'm looking for. I want to be out of this loop and out of this loop. I want to be out of all these loops. Exit do won't do it. Exit do will take you out of the current do loop. What can you say? Exit do squared. I want to go out of the next loop up. No. The only way to do this is with a statement that most books on VBA don't even talk about. Our author talks about it. It's a statement called go to. Go to end of loops. This is just a label. It's an arbitrary label, any identifier. End of loops. I can then take that label and put it somewhere else in my code with a colon after it, and that creates a label. Go to is what our author refers to as unconditional branching. Just we're going to get to this point, go to somewhere else in the code. This case in the if statement says, get to this point, and depending on a certain value here, you'll execute some code or some other code. But what the go to statement says, it says just jump to this particular location. This is the only valid use of the go to in normal programming, is to say, I want to get myself out of all this set of loops, just yank me out of it. You can use go to to send yourself back up in the code, send yourself back down. You've got to stay inside the same sub procedure, thank goodness. But if you say, oh, you know what? At this point, I really want to just jump back up here and start this again, and you use a go-to with that, instead of building your loop such that it would do that automatically, it's going to end up being, in fact, this is where we get the term spaghetti code, where it goes from here and then jumps down to here. It's really difficult to maintain and to read. So our book talks about go-to, but the caution is this is the only valid use. For debugging, there's some other things you would use it for, but in terms of production code, that's it. <coughs> Jump out past multiple loops at once, because there's no statement that will do that. <coughs> All right, folks, that's it. I'll post the code. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.